Welcome to Crossroads Online Experience. Thank you so much for being part of our online family. No matter if you're engaging with us today through Facebook, YouTube, or another social media platform, we believe that life change is going to happen today in your life. And so no matter where you are in this world, I pray that you engage with us today as we search scripture and the truths that God has given each and every one of us. Thank you so much for tuning in today, and we're excited to hear about your life change story. Father God, we exalt you this morning. And we don't worship a dead God, but we worship a Savior that's alive today. And because of his resurrection, God, we have power in our lives. We have victory in our lives. There's nothing that can stand against you, God. And Lord God, we stand with our resurrected King. Because God, we stand in victory. We stand in victory over doubt, in victory over disease and victory over defeat, God. And right now, in the name of Jesus, God, I pray that you would loose your people, Lord, that we wouldn't walk in that spirit of defeat. We wouldn't walk in that spirit where we're begging you to give us victory, God, when we already have victory in you. We worship you this morning, God, because you are our resurrected King. It's in your name we pray. Amen and amen. Now, when we think about that song, I think so often sometimes as Christians, we walk around begging God for a victory when we already have a victory. We just need to learn how to lay hold of what God has already given us because we have everything we need. If Jesus Christ can rise from the dead, then what problem in our life is bigger than that? It's absolutely nothing that can hold him back Except when we get to that place where we don't believe in the promise, we don't believe in the provision, we don't believe in what God's done, then we forfeit that and we allow Satan begin to fill our minds and tell us what we're going to think and how we're going to live. But right now in the name of Jesus, I rebuke that thinking. That is not our thinking. That is what he tries to impose on us. <laughs> Let me pray for us again. Father, in the name of Jesus. God, I just feel like there are people in this room that are captive to unbelief, God. Lord, we've been letting Satan beat us up and bully us around. God, we've been walking by sight and not by faith. And God, right now in this morning, I pray that you bind the hand of the strong man because you are the Almighty One. God, that you would loose your people from the chains of bondage, God, that they have put on themselves because there are no chains that can hold us in Jesus Christ. We are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. We're more than victorious in Christ Jesus. God, I pray that we would lay hold of the victory that you had laid hold of when you rose from the dead, Jesus. We wouldn't walk around like cowards, but we walk around like winners. We wouldn't walk around like losers, but we walk around like people who've been given new life. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that this morning that the spirit that's in us would be stirred up, that you would kindle our hearts, God, in such a way that we leave here and we're on fire for you, Jesus. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So this is our last week of the elephant in the room. Good thing it looked like it got a little weak there during worship. (laughs) Sort of fell over on us. But, you know, as as we've been talking about this topic of the elephant in the room, we talked about week one, the whole idea. We just sort of ripped the Band-Aid off, and we talked about the topic that most uh, people don't want to talk about. Uh, We just talked about tithing in a real practical way. Just here's what it is. Uh, I didn't make up the topic. Uh, God's the one that introduced the topic. God's the one that put the elephant in the room, and, and we just laid it out there. So if you missed week one, please go back and listen to it. Uh, I want to tell you this, though, about week one. Week one was not an attempt to get money out of your pockets. God doesn't need your money. God doesn't need my money. You see, sometimes when I speak on tithing, you think I'm just speaking to you, but... Everything I talk to you about replies to me as well. You realize that, right? What God wants is to love him with all your heart, all your minds, 
all your strength, and all your soul. When we talk about money, God simply wants our hearts. And we'll talk more about that. But then in week two, we talked about how our desires are the things that begin to control us. And, and we put a lot of these things on the elephant up here that are the very things that are the desires that are pulling us. You know, uh, uh, going to the, the salon too much. You know, somebody put up here. And then alcohol and then loans. And all these things are the things that, uh, that bog us down in life. But then there are other things like food and fast food and fear and luxury items. So all those things can get us into a place where... We don't know how to get out. And we talked about last week how we have to starve those desires out. We have to come up with ways so that we don't feed those desires because they keep wanting more and more. Remember what the, the, the Bible says. It says that desire is never satisfied. But as I have talked to people over the last few weeks, I've heard so many stories of victory about how people had started tithing or how people have been doing it for years and how they've seen the faithful hand of God through so many different situations and as, as I begin to see those stories it just encouraged my heart that you know all of us listen I think all of us desire to have a God story that story you get to tell about what God did in your life that story that you get to tell that brings glory to him. Everybody, I think, everybody that follows Jesus wants to have that story. But the only way you get that story is if you can't produce it. And when we open the door in our giving and through tithing and other things, it allows God to do things that we can't produce. And I want us to hear one more story that's just so powerful. It just amazes me when I listen to it. But let's, uh, let's watch this together. So we've been attending Crossroads for a couple of years. We um, hadn't really been tithing, we'd give here and there, but um, once we um, started attending the financially free class, we one of the first sessions talked about tithing. We decided if we were gonna tithe, then let's do it. Let's do what God asked us to do and do the 10%. Um, and so once we made that decision and started tithing on a regular basis, um, Little things kind of started happening. Um, you know, kind of a little random check here and there showed up. The class was wrapping up, and we were uh, we were really excited about getting our plan together uh, and finding out you know, how quickly we could get out of debt. And we came to the realization that I was going to soon have to leave my job, um, and that was kind of a gut punch. Um, and then we came to another realization that I found out that um, we were going to be expecting our first child. Um, which was a very exciting time, but also a little scary um, because Ben was going to have to leave his job and we weren't sure when his a new job would start and when we would have income again. And so we're planning for a new baby, but also going down to one income when we had been a two income household. Um, and that was really pretty terrifying yeah, cool. um, to think about. But we decided that we had made this commitment that we were going to tithe and so during that time, anything that came in, um, whether it was $100 or $10, we tithed on that. We continued to tithe, and every month when it could have been so easy to rely on ourselves, we instead decided to trust in God. And every month He took care of us. Uh, so since I had you know time on my hands, uh, <laughs> it gave me an opportunity to help my parents out for a little bit. Um, both my aunt and my grandmother had uh, had passed away. A lot of their stuff, you know, was sitting around, and my parents said, you know, if it's going to help you out, uh, anything you find that may be of value, uh, feel free to, you know, put on Craigslist, you know, try to sell, uh, see what you can get for it. And one of these things that they had in their basement was this uh, Chinese uh, silk embroidery. And finally, I found this auction house up in New Jersey who you know, specialized in Oriental antiquities. And they offered to take a look at it. And so I shipped it all the way up there and they estimated it selling for, you know, 600 bucks or something. This thing sold for $27,000 and we got nearly 25 grand of that in a check. I know that because we made this decision to trust in God and to tithe, um, even before circumstances were challenging um, that he provided for us in a way that is unexplainable other than it was God. 
And of course, when you know we got you know uh, our portion after splitting with my parents, uh, we had to be generous with uh, with what we received and, and tithed on on that. And it wasn't long after uh, I got another job, and uh, right in time for our baby girl to be born. When I think about that check and I tell that story, um, I tell people there's no other way to explain that other than God. Um, there's no other way to explain how we got through 10 months of being on one income other than God. Um, and I know that if we hadn't been tithing and investing in His kingdom during that time, um, that probably wouldn't have been the case for us. Um, we probably would have racked up more debt, turned to credit cards, done whatever to do to get by, but instead we trusted and He provided. So now every time I think about taking something to a yard sale or a thrift store, I'm thinking, what's this really worth? You know, it's like, you got that fear in your heart. But I want you to imagine this. Oftentimes we see what we have. And when we see what we have, we think that's all that God has. And so we live our lives based on just what we see. This is a perfect picture of God has what you don't see. And here's the amazing thing. What God has can be right in front of you and you never see it. So what God wants us to do in our lives is learn to trust him so that we can see what he has. And the only way you see what he has is you trust him. And I really believe that this tapestry was waiting there all this time for that moment when God was going to use it for his people. And that's what he does in our lives. When we talk about this, what God wants us to see is not that we're talking about giving 10%, not that we're talking about controlling our desires. What God wants us to really tap into in our lives, Christians, is what he has. You see, if we just live our Christian lives based on what we have, then we're not ever going to experience the power of God in our life. And when we don't experience that, then we walk in defeat. We walk being beat down by Satan, and we don't have all that God wants to experience. And this goes far beyond money. You see, some of us walk in what we have in our marriage, and we never experience what God has. Some of us walk in what we have in those attitudes, and we never experience how God wants to deliver us. Our whole life should be a life of faith where we're trusting God. And when it comes to money, that's just one of those things that comes along with everything else. And God really wants us to walk so that we can see what he has. Because in this life, we all get in situations where we don't have enough. I remember years ago when my wife and I uh, came out to start Crossroads Church. And we had moved from security uh, at the church we were at. And we immediately took, uh, you know, a two-thirds pay cut to come and plant this church. And so we were on staff at Noonan. And, of course, you know, we have four kids now. And everything's different, all these responsibilities. And I remember one of those weeks, you know, we all had those weeks where you just didn't have, you didn't have enough uh, paycheck to get you to the end of the month. And I had to go to a meeting. I can't remember if I was doing a wedding or a funeral, but I, for some reason I had a, a sports coat on. And I put my sports coat on, and I was doing something. I reached into the pocket, and there was a check in there. And I pulled it out, and I think it was for a couple hundred dollars. Well, it had been a, probably a year and a half before when we left the church that we were at, before we left, they said, Greg, we want to just show you how much we love you. And they said, we want you to stand at the back door. And as people leave, they're going to give you a love offering. So people just started, you know, giving me money. And I was sticking in my, stuck that check in my pocket. Well, it's been a year and a half. I'm thinking, this check, there's no way this check's any good. So I called them. Oh, yeah, pastor, please use that check. That was for you. We wonder what happened to it. But why did God wait to that moment to show me what he had? 
because he knew at that moment I really needed to see what he had. You're going to have those moments in your life, I promise you. And listen, even if you tithe, that's not a secret formula to you having great wealth monetarily. But it is a secret formula to open the door to what God has. And it can be in so many different ways. You could be healthy beyond reason. You could have family issues that never explode. There's so many ways that God can bless you. So what God wants us to do is to tap into that. But in order to tap into that, we have to protect. Listen, we have to protect our hearts from all the things that try to pull us away from God so that we don't trust him anymore, so we don't walk in faith anymore, so we're not really living that life when people look at us and say, only God can do that. As a matter of fact, in the book of Proverbs, he tells us this. He says, above all else, guard your what? For it is the wellspring of what? So what God tells us is, is, Life comes from the heart. Because when God saves you, he gives you a new heart. And so you and I live our lives out of this redeemed heart that God has given us. And he says, this is the source of life for you. Out of it is a wellspring. He doesn't say it's a little trickle. He doesn't say it's a little dripping faucet. He says it's a wellspring. In other words, it has abundance. It has more than you could ever know. There's more there than you could ever tap into. And so you have to do something. You got to protect it. Guard it. Now, you only guard things that are valuable, right? <laughs> you only guard things that need to be protected. Listen, if you got a piece of junk and you want to get rid of it, just leave it outside the garage, right? Somebody maybe come by and get it. But if you got something that's valuable to you, what do you do? You close the garage door, make sure it's locked up. And if it's a, if it's a vehicle or if it's a SUV or a, or a four-wheeler or whatever, you go hide the key because you don't want anybody to get it. Why? Because you're guarding it. It's valuable. God says your heart's that way. Guard it. Because when you don't guard it, the enemy is going to come in and the enemy wants to deceive your heart. And when we use the word deceive, it means that he's going to do it in a way where that you think it's good, but it's not really good. You see, that's what deception is. Deception is not, oh man, that's terrible, I'm not going to do it. No, that looks good, let's do it. And he wants to deceive your heart so that he can pull it back away from God. So that he can begin to control your life again. And so it's so imperative that you and I protect our heart. Above all else, we guard it. And one of the ways that we guard it, listen. Listen to what he says. Wherever your treasure is, That thing you got under lock and key, wherever your treasure is, he says, there your heart will be also. So what you treasure, some of you, you, know, you treasure, listen, uh, y'all know, and I told you that last year I became a granddad, uh, not just once, not just twice, but three times in one year, all right, say amen. Amen. And I'm like, God, why couldn't you start with grandkids, right? <laughs> you, you had to endure all that stuff with kids, and, and you know, then the blessing, the real blessing comes, right? Now, kids were a blessing, and just sometimes they're just hard to find, aren't they? <laughs> but, you know, when you walk into the house, and your grandkids over there, grandbabies, they're not even walking yet, they're trying to, two of them. And they turn around and they got this big smile on their face and they get all excited because you walked in the room. You want to know what happens? Oh, yeah. You know, when my kids were young, don't touch that phone. Grandkid, he go. <laughs> you want my laptop? You know, it's like, it's like you just sucked right in. You know, it's like uh, they, your kids look at you. I never did that with me. That's right. They get everything they want. Because something they do to your heart 
And here's what God is saying about the things in life. Never let anything do to your heart only what I can do. That's why he says, love me with all your heart, mind, and soul. Then he turned around and said, protect that heart. And there's something about this heart protection you've got to understand. That for us in our lives and in this journey we call life, that we have to have something to live and it's money. And what God wants to protect us from, he says, listen, where your treasure is. So if you treasure money, you treasure what it can give you, then what happens is your heart goes to that place it goes to that place where you begin to try to try to protect what you treasure and so what God is saying is listen you got to do something with your treasure that changes your heart that changes what you're living for what you hold most valuable because that's what we begin to protect I saw this a long time ago in my life uh, where I had bought a new truck um, and I think that was a uh, Besides a minivan, that's the only new vehicle I bought. Well, I got four kids, okay? And so kids, uh, you know, they think a truck is something to play around, right? And, you know, it's new, it's shiny, and uh, when you get something new and shiny, you always hate to have that first scratch, don't you? But you know it's coming. And so there's like this, this barrier that's around my truck. Don't get within 20 feet of it or you will die, barrier, you know? Uh, and when the kids start getting closer, you know, it's like, don't drive that bicycle over there. Go out the street and ride it. <laughs> Hit somebody else's car. And then one day, the inevitable happened. My son comes flying down the driveway out of control on his bicycle. And there's my shiny red truck there like it's got a magnet to that bicycle. Boom, right in the side of it. He survived the crash, unfortunately. No. But I remember as I look back on that saying, why did that have my heart? Because what you'll begin to see is, is when things get your heart, you'll choose them over other things that should be more valuable. There is nothing in this world that should be more valuable than people. There's nothing in this world that should be more valuable than your family. There's nothing in this world that should be more valuable than that person that's lost on the street holding that sign that says, I need food. Nothing should be more valuable than the people that God has created because only people can love you back. Money will never love you back. A truck will never love you back. A car will never love you back. Clothing will never love you back. As a matter of fact, all these things that we have on our elephant, those things don't love us back. And what God wants us to understand and what he wants us to do is, listen, let your treasure, let your treasure help you understand where your heart is. And what he's not saying, though, is he doesn't say, hey, listen, I don't want you to have treasure. As a matter of fact, God, listen, God wants us to grasp this, that money is important because we all have to have it to live off of, don't we? We all have to have it to eat, to drive, to have clothing, to all that stuff. And we know that we have to have this. But when we have it, what we need to understand is that if it has us, then there's a problem. Listen to what he tells us in 1 Timothy 6.10. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, listen to this, eager for money. Let me say that again, eager for money. What does that mean? It means they're, they're consumed with getting it, consumed with having more of it, consumed. All they think about is, you know, that next thing, that next page, that next day, they're consumed with it. Have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. What God says is, listen, what you know is and what you'll see is that when money has your heart, then what will happen is, is that it will consume you to have more of it and more of it and more of it and more of it. And here's the reality of it. You can never get enough of it. That's how you know you're consumed. You can't have enough. We all know what it's to be consumed by something. You put your favorite dessert in front of you. 
you began to understand what it means to be consumed by something, right? You just, it's just hard to stop. You know, you're, you're past full. You're like, you know what, can I, can I get another swallow down, you know, just because this is so good. You're consumed by it. And God said, listen, you can be consumed by this process. You can be consumed by it because when you're consumed by it, you really love it. And when you love it, it has your heart. And when it has your heart, he said, listen, there are many griefs that come with it. And matter of fact, some people have been pulled away from their faith. As I look back through the years of pastoring, I can honestly say this. Not that all the other stuff was lies that I said. Uh, that always sounds weird. I say, why do you ever say that? That just sounds so stupid, right? Now I'm going to quit lying to you and I'm going to tell you the truth, right? I want to emphasize this. That when I speak on money, I get more negative emails than any other time. And why do you think people get mad for me speaking on money? I didn't write the book. I just tell you what's in the book, right? Do you want me just to tell you part of the book that you like? Oh, you're going to be okay. Just spend everything you got. It's, it's going to work out all right. You might be homeless. You might not eat for a little while. You know, just, no. I got, I got to tell you the truth. You want to hear the truth, don't you? Amen. Amen. I mean, if your car's on fire and you're driving down the road, you want me to ride by and wave at you? <laughs> no, you want me to... Get your attention. Why? So you don't burn up in it. If you're heading for destruction, you know, and financial destruction, you want me to just say, hey, have a good time. You're going to kill yourself. You know? No, you want me to say something to you. And so I tell you all this, and I want to restate this. Not because I want your money. I don't need your money. Why would I need your money when I got God? Amen? God has more than one tapestry hidden somewhere. He's got all the resources that we need. And so if God has all that he needs, then why would he even speak about money? Because it's not about money. It's about our heart. It's about protecting our heart. It's about guarding it. And so he wants us to understand that. So listen. If you get mad at God and run for your faith because somebody talked about money or tithing and you didn't like it, then that should be an indication. That should be all the message you need right there. Why would I run from a God who's all good and all loving that wants nothing but the best for me? Why would I run from something that he gives to me that I don't like to hear? It doesn't fix me. It just keeps me the same. Maybe I should try running a different direction and run to him so he can fix what's broken, so he can change me into what he wants me to be, so I can be free from those things that would lead me away from my faith in God. So money is not evil. Money that has my heart is evil, right? So don't be afraid to earn money. There's nothing wrong with earning money. Listen, I hope you all get rich. I hope every one of you gets rich. But I hope more that you're rich in God and not just worldly things. But if you can handle both, then I pray God blesses you with both. Because this is what I know. That you'll understand if you get to that place what God wanted you to understand even get to that place. That when you sow generously, you reap generously. And when you have a heart of generosity, remember a heart of generosity, it has to come from our heart, then God does something in us. And so 
don't look at money and say, I don't need any because it's evil. Look at our heart and say, God, how do I protect my heart from this? You're telling me to guard my heart from this because I don't want to go down that road. Because when I get there, I realize that money is not the key to happiness. Even though our society wants us to think that way, if you have enough money, you can get whatever you want. I'm telling you, you can have all the money in the world and not get what you want. You can have every penny that's out there and it won't make you happy. It will do nothing to make your heart happy. And listen, it won't love you back. Listen, you can love it all you want to. Oh, I love you, money. You're so great. It actually stinks when you smell of it. But if you and I, listen, if we'll learn not to love it, but just to use it, then we'll realize that God is the source of my joy, that God is the source of my happiness, that God is the source of my peace, that God is the one that overcomes anxiety in my life, that God over, overcomes worry, and I can have all the money in the world and still not be free from all those things because they come from God, not from money, not from this world. So what God is saying is learn how to balance it. So that it doesn't control you. And so he tells us in Luke 12, 34. For where your treasure is. There your heart will be also. And so if I, listen. If I want my treasure to be over here. And if I really, which I think all believers do. If I want God to be the very thing that I treasure in my heart and I want my heart to be connected with God and I want to love him with all my heart, mind, strength and soul. If I want to love God that way, then what he's telling me is, is that I have a part in this process. That I can actually determine part of where my heart is by the actions that I have. And so he says, listen, wherever your treasure is, what you treasure the most there your heart will follow. And so if this is my treasure, if I feel like I'm being controlled by this and I want to be controlled by God, then let God have what I treasure. Why? Because my heart follows. It changes my heart. You may not believe me because you had not tried it yet, but I'm telling you, it works. My wife and I, listen, we practice this. Our first 10% goes to God. Why? Because Deuteronomy tells us, listen, the purpose of the tithes is to remember to always put God first. What is first will have first place in my life. And what is first has to be God because he wants to be the love of my life, my first love according to Revelation. And so God is saying, listen, let that treasure help direct your heart. And so every time we get paid, I make sure my treasure is going to God first. And as we said, it's his anyway, right? But, and then I got all this left over. So what I do is I have to decide how I keep my heart going in the right direction. First Timothy tells us in verse 6, excuse me, verse 17, chapter 6. He says, command those who are rich in this present world. I know some of us are like, well, that doesn't include me. Keep reading, though. We'll listen. You go to Haiti, you're rich. You go to India, you're rich. You go to Honduras, you're rich. You may not be rich in this room, but you're rich. You just don't realize it's in this context. Tell those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in what? Which is so uncertain. But to put their hope in who? God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. And so what he says is, listen, I want to protect your hearts, and I don't want you to hope in your money, but I want you to hope in me. And so what I have discovered in life 
is because I consistently tithe, it always keep, creates this, this connection with God where it said, God, I trust you. God, I trust you. Lord, I know that we're going through a tough time there right now, but I still trust you. And so I give this to you. I give this because it's yours. And I keep doing that and keep doing that. And what happens is it helps me to see God's hand in all that he's doing, see God's provision that he has because God has what I don't have. But when I give him what I have, I'll see what he has. And that's what I've seen over and over again. Amen. Y'all can clap. And so what he's saying here is I'm giving you the power. I'm giving you the power to break that thing in your life that's holding on to you. And I'm giving you that power through being generous. And so, you know, if you give 10% and then you save 10%, which is what I advocate because I think you always need to be ready for that rainy day. Because guess what? It's been raining a lot lately, hasn't it? And you may be thinking that's your house. Man, it's been raining at our house too. And it ain't, it ain't water. It's, we've got debt. we got all this stuff going on. I understand. But the verse applies even further than that. You see, one of the things that my wife and I do is we give beyond the tithe. Because I really believe that's what this verse is talking about. He says, listen, be generous and willing to share. And that goes in a lot of different directions. A long time ago, uh, we, in, we, we adopted a child from Compassion International. And this child's in another country. I've never seen him before. But every month for, uh, I don't know, at least 10 years, we've sent, maybe longer than that, we send $38 a month. And it provides for this kid to go to school. It provides food for him. It allows him to get an education. I may never meet this child. But I know one thing, that he knows every time he gets that money that somebody is blessing him. And here's what it does to my heart. It helps me not to love the world more than I love people. Now my wife, she said, hey, why don't we support these missionaries? And I said, all right, but here's what we didn't do. See, this is what some people do. They misunderstand. Well, let's just take some of what we give to God. And so you take that and you give it to the missionaries. You give it to support that kid. And then you give God what's left. Well, it's not 10% anymore, is it? And so somebody asked me during the series, said, what do you do about people who give their money that's their tithe and they give it to other things? I said, well, I don't do anything. It's not my responsibility. No, no, what, is it, what does it teach? Well, let me tell you what the Bible teaches. But I know a lot of people get confused on this. When the Bible speaks of tithing, it says to bring it into the storehouse. In other words, a place of worship. Because that's where you're getting fed. That's where you're getting God's word. That's where the Bible instructs us. And you see this all through the Old Testament. You see it in the New Testament. The other thing is, is the reason you tithe to the church, the church you go to, is because when you come and you listen, whether you're online or you're in the building, when you're listening to somebody teach you, then God says that you're to take care of those who instruct you, who pour into you, who oversee you, that you're to take care of those people. So that would be me and other staff people. So that's why you give to God's church because this is where you get fed and you're getting the blessing what God is giving me or somebody else who's pouring into you. So those are just two of the real clear reasons why when you give, you're tithe, you tithe to the church. Amen. So, don't mess with God's 10. That's his, right? <laughs> Amen. All right, second thing though. So what we have done as a family is out of what God has left us to live off of, which is 80% once we put back 10 to save, then we turn around and say, all right, 
We're going to support this little kid in South America. We're going to support this missionary couple that goes all around the world. And that comes out of this. It doesn't come out of God's. It comes out of this. Why? Because I want to make sure that I don't fall in love with what's left. I want to protect my heart. I want God to have my heart. Why? Because, listen, God has much more than 80%. He has more than anything that you could ever fathom. And if you can trust him, you and I will see what he has. So he says, listen, command those to do good. Do good with what you have so if you see somebody on the side of the road then pull out money and say God I just feel like you want me to bless them and so you take some money and you bless them with it listen it is not up to you to follow them to see how they spend it your blessing was giving God will take care of how they spend it don't rob your blessing by being jaded because you saw somebody misuse the gift. You gave the gift to God, didn't you? He says, well, you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me, brethren. So do it unto the least of these, and you're doing it unto Jesus, and you'll never lose your reward because Jesus always sees what you do, and he sees why you do it. And so you and I can be comforted in the fact that even if they misuse it, that's not on me. Why? Because we want to always be generous and willing to share. Don't let people ruin your hearts. And when we do that, we begin to see that God begins to take a bigger portion of our heart. We protect ourselves. And what happens in life is all these things, all these things on our, our elephant in the room, fear, jealousy, house repairs, debt, all these things that have been controlling our life, we begin to see that when God protects our heart, he protects us from the elephant in the room. And what God does that with, listen, because we have decided to use the sword of the Spirit, this is the biggest one they would give me. That's not sharp either. But you remember in, in, in Ephesians chapter 6, he says that when we battle against the spiritual forces, we battle with them and against them with the sword of the Spirit. And so all we've been doing this last three weeks is we've been taking the sword of the Spirit, God's Word, and saying this is how it applies to the things in our life, the money in our life, the resources in our life, the debt in our life. And when we use the sword of the Spirit, we overcome, we, 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 we tear down the arguments that the elephant in the room brings at us. And so so God's saying, listen, live by the sword of the Spirit, the truth of God's Word, and you won't run back into the elephant in the room. As a matter of fact, you will come to this place where you begin to slay the elephant, and as the elephant is slain, then you will begin to take control of your life, and God begins to help you overcome this elephant in the room so that you don't come back time and time again, and, and you see the elephant, oh, we got to talk about the elephant again. And so what God is telling you is, listen, why don't this time in your life, not go back. Why don't you just decide for once and all to go ahead and stab the elephant? Because I know this. There's nobody in this room that wants to ever hear another tithing message and you're not tithing. I just know that. There's nobody in this room that wants to have another conversation with your spouse about how broke you are and how much you own your credit cards. There's nobody that ever wakes up and says, man, we're going to get to talk about the credit card tonight. Woo, we owe $10,000. Nobody does that. So why leave the elephant in the room? Why just avoid those conversations? Listen, if you just begin to live out what God has taught us over the last three weeks, you don't have those conversations anymore. What you might have a conversation on is, you know what? God has blessed us so much. Who are we going to help? Wouldn't that be a different story? You know, we got some leftover. And it ain't in the refrigerator either. 
We got some leftover in what God has blessed us with. Who can we help? Wouldn't that be a cool story? Wouldn't that be so much different than, I don't know how we're going to make it to the end of the month. You see, God's saying, you have the, Christian, you have the power. The word has given us the power to overcome the spiritual enemy that keeps telling us the wrong things. And listen to what God says. In this way, 1 Timothy 6, 19. In this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. So that they may take hold of the life that is what? Truly life. Do you hear what God's saying? (laughs) This is not life. This helps you to live. But it's not truly life. And so he says, listen, if you'll take what I blessed you with, And don't invest it short-sightedly just in a retirement age of 65. Invest it beyond that point and lay up some treasure in heaven because you're going there, right, Christian? Aren't you going there? Amen. Amen. You're going there? And when you get there, wouldn't it be amazing if you were surprised And how much was there because you invested in the kingdom of God? The things that you never even know that you had an impact on. But you invested in the kingdom of God. If you invest in Crossroads Church and the ministry we have here, then that means you have been a part of us starting or partnering over 40-something churches since we started this business, when we started this church. That's what God is doing. Countless people. I say countless because we weren't about numbers in the early days. We were just excited people were getting saved. We were just dunking them. You know, we didn't put a mark on anything. But there have been thousands and thousands and thousands of people that know Jesus. Because you give to this church. You're investing in something that maybe you don't realize you're investing in, that you're making a difference. And so when you get to heaven, it's not going to be that you just put a bunch of money aside and you got a bunch of furniture sitting over there that God had put there for you and you got a nice car. What's going to happen is when you step into the kingdom, you're going to see these souls of individuals that are here, that Sally's here, Bill's here, Jeff's here. All these people are here because you invested in something that wasn't of this world, but it was the other world and you made a difference for their kingdom. Then you know what life really is. Then you know what life really is. So church, above all else, what we take away from the last three weeks is guard your heart. Every time you have a chance to give, guard your heart. You know what I do? I go, and I go into my bank account online, and my bill pay, and I set up God first. As soon as my check goes in there, the first check that goes out, Crossroads Church. You see, I've set up a system to guard my heart. If I'm on vacation, I guard my heart. I still give. God has the first. And then all the other stuff. Then all the other stuff. Listen. I know some of you are scared to death. I want to say this again, in case you didn't hear me the first two weeks. If you're afraid to give God 10% of your first, first fruits, not 10% of leftovers, for the next three months, at the end of those three months, if God has not blessed you in some fashion, you come up to this church, you say, I need to see Pastor Greg, and you come and tell me that God didn't bless you in some fashion, And I'll go to the front office and say, cut this person a check for every penny they gave in that three-month period. Say, Greg, can you do that? Not sure, but I just did. (laughs) You know why I say that, though? Because I know my God. Amen. (laughs) 
And since 22 years old, when I gave my life to Jesus Christ, I've been practicing tithing. I haven't starved to death. And I can tell you, I cannot count the blessings that God has given me. Another piece is, listen, you can't guard your heart if you don't have a process to manage your money. You got to know where your money's going. Now listen, it's going somewhere. Why don't you just tell it where to go rather than it's just going by itself? That's all I'm saying. Sign up for our financially free class. Let us help you. Please, let us help you. I don't want to sit here and put pressure on you that you don't need. I want to help you be free. So take that step. Go out to our next step area after this is over. And just take a step. We'll help you get to where you need to be. But let me tell you this. You'll never get there without inviting God in. And you'll never invite God in until you take a step of faith. Because it doesn't happen because all the numbers work. It happens because my faith works. But even after saying all that, Please hear this. If you're not a Christ follower, just pretend like we didn't talk about money this morning. Because it's really about your heart. Jesus wants to save you for all of eternity. But he can't save you if he doesn't have your heart. Because he's got to have that old broken heart that you got, the one that keeps messing your life up, the one that you keep trying to fill with all the stuff and the relationships and stuff and stuff, and it doesn't work, and you're still empty. He's got to have that heart because when you'll give him that heart, the Bible says he'll give you a new heart, a redeemed heart, a changed heart. Amen? <laughs> and when he gives you that redeemed, changed heart, then you're going to know what to live for. Then you're going to know what's going to make you have joy in life. And all that stuff you've been looking for, you won't have to look at it anymore because you'll have all you need in Jesus. And that's where it starts at this morning. Your first step is to give your life to Jesus Christ who died on the cross for your sins to set you free from the power of them so that you could have life eternal. Because he didn't stay in the grave, by the way. He rose from the grave. Amen. Amen. So as we wrap up this morning, I, I just really feel in my heart that there are some of you in this room. You say, Greg, I want to be there. But if I were honest with you this morning, I'm not really sure how we're going to eat this week. And I just want you to know that's breaks my heart that you're there I want you to know that I care about where you are and I want to pray with you if you're in that spot because I don't want you to leave here hurting thinking you're all by yourself that nobody cares nobody's with you and so church I just want to ask you to bow your heads and if you're one of those people listen if you're one of those people with our heads bowed and eyes closed, nobody looking around, I don't want anybody to feel embarrassed this morning. I just really want to be able to pray for you and minister to you in the midst of your difficult time. If you're, if you're one of those people who say, Greg, I don't, I don't even know how I'm going to feed my family this week, and you would let me pray with you, would you just raise your hand up? Say, Greg, I just struggled this morning. I see you. got your hand raised I want to do something a little bit outside the box I want to come down here in the front and meet you there because I want to lay hands on you and pray for you if you'll just step out in the aisle just come down here because my team's going to come around because I don't want you to feel alone I don't want you to feel like you know you're walking this pathway so nobody's looking around if you're that person say Greg I don't even know how we're going to get food on the table this week just meet me up here because I want to pray with you don't be ashamed. This is God's house.
around her, get around everybody here. I'm going to pray, and the church is going to pray with us as we pray over you folks. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just pray for your provision, God. You tell us that your children know it, never go hungry. That you meet all of our needs according to your riches and glory, God. And I thank you this morning that you're a need meter. God, that you're able to meet us where we are. You're able to meet us in our difficulty and our struggle. God, you're our provider. And I just pray, God, and thank you that we get a chance just to love on these people that are here. Pray with them, God, in the midst of their unknowingness. And I pray, God, this morning that their faith would be in you, God. That they realize that you have what they need, that you not only own the cattle on the thousand hills, you own the hills and everything they're on to, God. And Lord, I pray that they would feel the love of your church, God, realizing that they're not walking by themselves. provide for us and meet our needs. We thank you for that. Churches, your heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I want to ask you guys this morning we want to help provide for you guys. church it's not about money we're about people we want people to be loved on and cared for we want you guys to know that we love you and care for you that you're going through this struggle father may they take every resource that's been given to them and bring glory to you with it and use it God as your provision from heaven to them in Christ's name wants this morning is he wants our heart he wants all of it. he don't want part of it so this morning if you're that person that needs to invite Jesus into your life then I want you to put your hand on your heart this morning and I want you to raise your hands if you're that person this morning that has any kind of struggle that you say Jesus I, I, I find myself being pulled with money I find myself being pulled with my job I find the elephant in the room pulling me then right now I want our whole church just to make a commitment this morning that Jesus you have our hearts you have our heart, Jesus. So you lift your hand up. Everybody put their hand on their heart and lift your hand up and say, God, this is my offering to you this morning. I want you to have all of me, 100% of me, not just half of me. And this morning, if you need prayer or you made a decision to trust God, as we, to trust him as your savior, then I want to invite you down front. But for the rest of us right now, we're surrendering it all to God. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we want you to have all of us. 
God, we don't want to be holding anything back in the closet, God. We don't want to be holding money back. We don't want to be holding possessions back. We don't want anything to have a little corner of our heart, God. We want you to have 100% of all of it, God. And this morning, we surrender. Our hands are lifted high, God, because we want you to be the love of our lives. We want you to be the passion of our lives. We want you, God, to be the very one that we live for. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you again for joining us today. We are so excited that you are a part of our online family. In fact, we would like to walk along this journey with you. So if you made any type of decision today, if you will go below, there is a website there that will help us engage with you and be a part of your next steps. We cannot wait to see you again next week because we believe that God has a message for you.